Hello everyone and welcome to Storytime with Jocelyn. Today's story is very special. We're going to be reading a story about this polar bear. And if you can see, he's wearing a sailor outfit and on the side it says the RMS Titanic and it has the White Star Lines logo. We are reading today, if you could tell, because Jocelyn also has a Titanic pillow and she is wearing her 3D Titanic glasses that she got years ago when we went to see Titanic in 3D. So we're going to be reading a story about Titanic today in honor of last Friday's anniversary of 111 years ago, the Titanic sink in the Atlantic. So today's story is actually really sweet. It is about this bear and we're going to be reading Polar, a true story of the Titanic bear. So we're really excited to begin today's story, aren't we, Jocelyn? All right, let us go ahead and begin with Polar, the Titanic bear, which was written by Daisy Corning Stone Steppen and it was illustrated by Lori McGall. We're gonna learn a little bit of history as well. To the memory of Douglas and Polar and to Susie and Isabel whose adventures just begun. And this is Daisy Steppen at her home in Tuxedo Park, the author of this book. I'm gonna go ahead and read the introduction so you'll learn about why this book came about and the story of Polar and the Titanic Bear. And I think it would be really good for you to learn something. So, I discovered this story about a little boy and his toy bear among the belongings of one of my relatives, Daisy Coningstone Steppen, which is the author of this book. It is a true story that Daisy wrote for her only son, Douglas. She painted a cover illustration for it and gave it to Douglas on Christmas Day in 1913 when he was eight years old. Douglas, or Master, as he is called in the story, adored Polar, his beautiful white Maha bear. Polar was made by the famous Steffen Company of Germany and was brought by Douglas's aunt at the FAO Swartz in New York City. Now the oldest toy shop in America, FAO Swartz, still sells stuffed bears, Steffen bears. I've been meaning to get one for Jocelyn. Polar was no ordinary bear. He had several outfits and his own furniture. Kind of reminds me of build Aslan has a lot of those. He took part in all family celebrations and holidays. Best of all, Polar went along on the Stefden's family's world travels. Douglas's parents were very wealthy. They were able to devote their lives to their son, their travels, and their hobbies. Daisy kept detailed diaries and was a photography buff. Her husband, Frederick, selling, loved to sail, and Douglas had a nanny, Elizabeth Margaret Burns, whom he called Muddy Bones because he couldn't quite pronounce her name. The family lived in a fashionable town outside New York City called Tuxedo Park. They spent summers at the seaside near Bar Harbor, Maine, and winters at resorts around the world. The Steftons traveled on luxurious ocean liners that visited exotic ports in the Caribbean, Africa, and the south of France. 
Douglas was lucky enough to see things that other children only read about, including the Panama Canal, one of the greatest engineering achievements of all time. And the Eiffel Tower, the highest structure in the world in 1912. But life 80 years ago was not perfect, even for the rich. In those days, there was no cure for the childhood diseases such as measles and children who caught the deadly illness had to be separated from other people during the long recovery period. Mm -hmm. And traveling from Europe to North America was not a simple matter of six hour flight on a jet. Planes were rare and the only way to cross the ocean was to spend seven days on an ocean liner. When the Steffens were able to passage to America on the Titanic in April of 1912, they considered themselves very lucky. The Titanic was the biggest, newest ship in the world, a floating palace that contained every modern convenience and luxury. Douglas and Polar stepped onto the most magnificent passenger ship ever built in a state of great excitement, they never dreamed that they would soon be part of the most famous sea disaster of all time. That was written by Leighton H. Coleman III. This is Douglas with Polar at his feet. Six, sit, sits next to his parents on a hotel balcony on Mondelanian, and you can find Polar at the very bottom of his feet. I'll point him out to you. You see him right there? Polar went everywhere with Douglas. And this is where the story of Polar the Titanic Bear came from. So let us begin. That's my 10th bear today said the voice of a young woman proudly. Suddenly, I felt myself being hurled through the air, then landing with a thump on a hard wooden bench. Jocelyn, I opened my eyes and I looked around the large bright room littered with sawdust, tools, and sc scraps of felt. On either side of a long table sat a woman who were quickly sewing black glass eyes onto teddy bears. I soon learned that they earned their living by making bears and other stuffed animals for toy shops around the world. Christmas was approaching and they had been given a large order. This special lot of bears, including me, was to be shipped from Germany to America. I wondered where America was and how I was to get there, but I didn't have long to wait. The next morning, I was cramped into a box, my toes touching my ears. Weeks passed in darkness as I was jousted this way and that. First, there was the rumbling of the baggage claim, then the swaying of the ship, then the shouts of the dock hands. But I forgot about my aching limbs when a young woman lifted me out of the box and sat me on a shelf with a dozen other bears. She dusted us all off and then tied blue or pink ribbons around our necks. I had arrived at the FAO Swartz in New York, the largest toy shop in the world. I was amazed by the beautiful things I could see from my perch. From the ceiling hung every sort of flying machine, airships, aeroplanes, and hot air balloons. In a long case in front of me were little furnishings for dollhouses tiny bird cages, baby carriages, and bathtubs with china dolls in them. There was a wonderful railway worked by electricity, and I could see a bright red engine going around and around past flashing signal towers and stations. Jocelyn and I would love to visit that place one day. Because it was Christmas time, the shop was busy every day. My bear companions disappeared one 
by one. And I couldn't help wondering where my turn would come. One day, a lady with red cheeks looked me over all carefully, strengthened my blue bow, and said she would take me along with her. I was sad to leave my lovely surroundings and hated being packed into a horrid little box again by one of the sales clerks. These are some postcards for the FAO Swartz store in New York City from 1910 and some toys. These are postcards, which sometimes you'll send or you could buy as souvenirs. For several days, I was left in a closet. I thought everyone had forgotten me, but finally one morning, the lady took me out of the box and then we went down to the docks where we boarded a large ship called the Corania. You can see Polar right there in the box. The decks of the ship were crowded with people saying goodbye. As I looked about wondering what was to become of me, a little boy came running up. Flinging his arms around the lady with the red cheeks, he cried, Oh, Aunt and Nanny, I wish you were coming with us. She gave him a big hug and then presented me to him. The little boy, my new master, had his father and mother with him and Nurse Burns, whom he called Muddy Boons. Several people came down to see Master's family off, and I was admired by each one in turn, which made me feel very proud. Right, Jocelyn? How high he holds his head, Master's father said. What will you call him? Polar, Master replied promptly. These are some pictures of Douglas's mother and his friends on the decks of the Corona. And here is a pitch of what the Corona looked like, maybe a postcard of some sort. So what I said today is based off of a true story. And here is a picture of Douglas getting his bear polar. A week later, we sighted the island of Madurania near Portugal, which was to be our home for the next few months. It was a beautiful bright afternoon when we went ashore. We traveled through the busy streets to our hotel in a rickety old wooden cart pulled by a bull. Ooh. Our hotel was very grand. Master Muddy Boons and I had a big sunny room overlooking the garden and the blue sea beyond. I spent many lazy days out under the palms, match, watching Master build little houses with sticks and stones and surround them with miniature gardens. And we rode in the Bollocks carts whenever we went up into the hills, exploring different parts of the island. And you can see Polar in the picture with Douglas. And here is some pictures at the hotel and different pictures around the island that they took. The real family, of course. If you can notice in this picture, he's wearing a sailor uniform, just like our polar bear is. One sad day, Master woke up with red spots all over his face. He's got measles, the doctor said gravely. We'll have to put him in quarantine. Everyone looked very worried. Master Muddy Boons and I moved to a little cottage a short distance from the hotel. Master's mother explained that being in quarantine meant staying away from other guests so that we wouldn't give them the measles. We weren't in our new home for five minutes before a big brown mouse scampled across the floor. Poor Maddie Booms shrieked and went after it with a broom. She soon named our cottage Mouse Castle because it was full of mice, rats, and ants. And she spent all her time minutes trying to kill them. <laughs> 
I didn't like my new quarters a bit, for Master was too sick to even notice me, and I was put in a corner and forgotten. Poor Polar. Right, Jocelyn? The doctor visited us often, and every day Master's parents came with fresh eggs and milk. Night after night, I watched as Muddy Boons sat awake holding Master's hot, limp hand in hers. A full week passed, and I began to wonder if he would ever be well enough to play with me again. But one morning, I heard Master ask for me in a faint little voice. Muddy Boons handed me to him, and he put me on his pillow, and there I laid without stirring the whole day. This is a picture of the real Mouse Castle, and you can see Muddy Boons at the window, the real Muddy Boons. And here is a picture of them. And you can see Polar right there on the pillow. Or Master, of course, which Polar calls him. Asks for him. Slowly, Master began to grow stronger. He would sit up in bed, wash my face and paws, tie my ribbon and give me my breakfast. I was so happy to see him better that I almost didn't care what he did to me but I didn't relish the bath Muddy Boons gave me one morning in a hard, smelly liquid called disinfectant. They had to because of the measles. She gave Master one too. Then two men came to the garden with a hammock. They carefully lifted Master in as he held tight to his little American flag in one hand and me in the other. Muddy Boons led the way and we all marched back to our own sunny room in the hotel. He must be doing better. There's Polar getting his bath and disinfectant. Disinfectant kills the germs that he would have spread to the other kids. So here's the real pictures of Douglas when he was sick and you can still notice Polar in some of the pictures. And then he was resting on the balcony in the hotel when he was doing better. And you can see him in a hammock being taken back from the castle, Mouse Castle, back to the hotel. This is him in the hotel, doing a little bit better. Eventually he was able to sit up and play and this is his doctor that took care of him when he had the measles. And here he is with Muddy Boons at the bottom. So there's his doctor and there's Muddy Boons with him. A little bit of fun. So early in April, we sailed back to America on the ship called the Adranica. After we arrived in New York, we went to Master's new home in Tuxedo Park, which was surrounded by trees and overlooked a little lake. When the weather turned hot and sticky, we went to the family's summer house near Bar Harbor, Maine. I enjoyed splashing in the ocean with Master or sitting on the rocks while he built forts and castles. Once he forgot about me and the tide came in and almost carried me out to sea. But luckily Master rescued me just in time. When winter came, we returned to Tuxedo Park. Master and I tumbled about in the snow and made snowman. Best of all, he gave me rides on his sled, running as fast as he could across the ice-covered lake while the cold wind whistled in my ears. At Christmas, I had my own tree and new toys to play with. I enjoyed the delicious turkey dinner served on a small table that Master made for me. This is where Polar is sitting at his own dinner table in Tuxedo Park. The real polar bear. <laughs> and him playing with Douglas, his master, on the sled. <laughs> in the new year, we sailed away for some hot, sunny places. We went to Panama where a great canal was being built right through the country so that ships could sail from one side to the other. 
One of the engineers invited Master Muddy Boons and me to ride out to see it in his big private car. Bright flocks of parrots flew from the trees as we roared down the jungle roads. Bermuda was our last stop. Master took me to a beautiful beach where we spent many a long afternoon. He would make a short of a throne out of the sand for me to sit on and say, now Polar, don't you run away, but just stay quiet while I work. So I sat there watching him play and sniffing the salt air. And here they are on the beach. And there's Polar's little sand chair that was made by Master. Here is a picture of the Panama Canal being built. And then there's another picture where, you know, where it shows the canal working with, you know, the canal. And then here is a picture of Douglas with his mother on the beach in Panama. So here is the, here's the Panama Canal being built and then a postcard of the waters coming and then Douglas and his mother. The next winter, we once more set sail on the Coronia, this time for Algiers in Northern Africa. The weather was sunny, so we spent our days on deck roaming about with the other children. The captain and the master were great friends, and we were often invited to his room for a cup of tea, as master called his hot water and sugar. In Algiers, we saw Arabs dressed in long flowing robes. We stayed in a big hotel with a garden where I could sit on a bench with muddy boons while master played ball. In February, we celebrated George Washington's birthday. Master invited a few friends. We decorated the table with American flags and master dressed in red and white and blue. After our tea party, we all fished presents from a big bag. This is them celebrating George Washington's birthday. You can see all that red, white, and blue. This is a postcard showing the main square in Algiers where they were at. And this is Douglas and his father in a hotel garden. From Algiers, we set sail for the south coast of France. At Monte Carlo, we rode to our hotel on the hill in a Fanny narrow railway. Master told me it was a functional railroad and that it was pulled along by a cable. Then we went to Canny's where we stayed for nearly a month. I sat in a hotel garden every morning while Master had an hour spelling lesson with muddy booms. One day we heard a loud buzzing noise. An aeroplane, Master shouted, throwing down his books. Goodness me, Muddy Boons cried, jumping to her feet. We all craned our necks up to the sky and watched as the aeroplane circled overhead. I could see the pilot sitting in the cockpit with his goggles on and he waved at us before heading out over the sea. These are some postcards that show scenes of the Monte Carlo and the Canis in 1912 and how it would look when they were visiting the family. And of course, them looking at the aeroplane, aeroplane. Back then there was very rare, so they called them aeroplane, not spelled as an air, A-I-R, but spelled as an air, as in aerospace, as in A-E-R-O-P-L-A-N-E. -E. Aeroplane. We took the night train to Paris, strolling in the toilet, Tuileries Garden, we saw boys selling their boats in the fountains and watched hot air balloons rising up toward the sky. Master took me partway up the Eiffel Tower one day and told me it was 984 feet high. He was always telling me the height and length of things. I was 
sorry when it was time to go back to America, for I loved Paris. But Master was excited because we were to sail to New York on the Titanic. A magnificent new ship. Everyone said she was the biggest ship in the world. We were going to be on the very first voyage. The Titanic had left England the day before, and her first stop was at Cherbourg, France. We took a train to Cherbourg and that evening went out to the huge ship on a little tugboat. As we stepped on board, the ship's doctor who had known all of us on the Adranica kissed Master and said, I see you still have Polar with you, little man. Everyone remembered Polar the Titanic bear. This is the nomadic which carried Douglas and his family out to the Titanic. You can see that in the movie, Titanic. And here is a White Star Line um, thing, but sort of like a tag that you would put on your luggage. And of course, a postcard of the Titanic. And like I said, that you could see that in the movie. That is the ship the little tugboat that would take passengers from the port of Cherbourg to the Titanic ship. And of course, here is Polar Bear ready to sail on the Titanic. We had fairly smooth weather those first few days and spent most of our time on deck where Master would spin his whip top and play ball. We know about of a boy with this famous pitcher that spins the top. But we also loved exploring the great ship. There was a giant staircase with a big glass dome over it. Master sent me flying down the banister one morning. In ship's gymnasium, we saw bicycles and rolling machines and even a mechanical camel for the passengers to ride on. So here is some pictures. Here's a picture of the gymnasium, the grand staircase. And here is somebody in the gymnasium riding one of the mechanical camels. The grand staircase, the gymnasium, and the passenger riding a camel, mechanical camel. And of course, there's Douglas with polar bear spinning the top. And of course there is, if you tell your parents, there is a famous picture of a boy on the ship of the Titanic rolling a top, spinning a top. There was a lovely sun polar on the upper deck where we spent our afternoons and Master allowed a little girlfriend of his to play with me. We ate in the first class dining saloon. The tables were there covered with stiffly starched white tablecloths and polished silver and the ship's band played for us every single night and our stateroom was even bigger than master's bedroom at home one day master's mother and muddy boons went down to the lower decks and had a turkish bath Ooh, they didn't like this hot steam bath one bit although they did enjoy a cooling dip in the ship's swimming pool afterwards it was our fifth night at sea. I had been in bed a few hours when I suddenly opened my eyes. The lights had been turned on. Muddy Boons was dressing master in a great hurry. So here's a picture of them on deck. I think that's one of the friends, I'm not sure. And here is a postcard of the swimming pool. And of course, you had to pay for the Turkish bath, even if whatever. And I think it says a dollar, depending on if you're going to do the Turkish or the electric bath. I'm not sure what was the difference. Uh, it's been too long, but I know it has something to do with the steam. But, um, and here, of course, like I said, is the swimming pool. So the ticket to the Turkish bath, this is what the Turkish bath looked like and of course the swimming pool. Wasn't very big, could only fit so much. It was deeper than it was wide. Come, 
we're taking a trip to see the stars, she said. Master's parents were already dressed. They were gathering a few belongings together. I was surprised when I saw Master's mother reach for life belts. Then seizing me from my little neck rack beside Master's bed, she tucked me under his arm. We soon joined a group of people standing in the main hall. Everyone was very quiet, talking in hushed voices. Someone whispered that we had struck an iceberg and that water was pouring into the ship. A young man in a uniform helped fasten on Master's life belt. Patting him on the head, he said, Goodbye, little man. Then Master's father told us to follow him to the top deck, where we would climb into one of the lifeboats. So this is where Douglas is getting dressed. You can see in the background his mother. This is Muddy Boone's dressing him and getting him ready. And of course, this is with him in his life belt holding polar. Something dire is happening. The lifeboat was swinging out from the ship's side and people had difficulty climbing aboard. Our little party kept together and when there was about 40 of us in the boat, an officer cried, lower away! And we were let down to the water in awful jerks. Master clasped me in his arms. His eyes were shut tight and his face was white. We finally reached the water safely and roared off toward a faint light on the horizon. It was very dark. Aside from the stars and the brilliantly lighted ship that towered above us, we could see nothing. Soon after we left the Titanic, the captain sent up rockets as a distress signal. We all watched the ship steadily except Master who was asleep. Two hours later, we saw the light, last light go out and held the dreadful cries that told us all was over. The great Titanic had gone down. It seems like a terrible and horrible dream. The heartbreaking silence and feeling of utter loneliness cast a deep gloom over our little boat lord, Jocelyn. Toward three o'clock in the morning, an icy breeze sprang up and the sea grew rough. Master opened his eyes and said he felt seasick, but Muddy Boons, who had held had him in her lap, soon quieted him with the story of Cinderella. About an hour later, someone suddenly shouted, here comes a ship. Looking toward the horizon, we saw a white light and then some rockets. As the ship gradually approached, we feared she might either run us down or not see us at all since we had no lantern. But soon she slowed down and then stopped. As the faint mist cleared just before dawn, the new moon was setting and a star was faintly twinkling on the pink horizon, Jocelyn. The first rays of the sun cast a wonderful glow on the icebergs that rose from the ocean all around us. Master suddenly opened his eyes and looked about him, explained, Oh, Muddy, look at the beautiful North Pole with no Santa Claus on it. A woman who had been crying smiled at him through her tears. Our rescue ship, the Carpathia, looked very small amidst the bid, few bits of wreckage where the huge Titanic had gone down. We finally drew aside alongside and the men climbed aboard the Carpathia on rope ladders and the women were hauled up in a sort of a, a swing thing and the children in canvas bags. Soon everyone had been rescued except for me. I lay alone in the empty lifeboat Several minutes went by, but nothing happened. Everyone seemed to have forgotten about me. My heart began to pound. I imagined being left there, tossed by the waves forever. Would I ever see my master again? That is so sad. Look at Polar, just by himself in the lifeboat. I hope he gets found. 
This is the Carpathia and the passengers. And one of the last pictures that were taken of a lifeboat down below when they were saving the people from the ocean. You got Carpathia and this is the pictures of this when they, somebody from the Carpathia took a pictures. Suddenly I felt a terrible jerk and then another. The boat swayed dangerously. I nearly fell into the icy water as several sailors pulled the lifeboat up to the decks of the Carpathia. I slid down the ribs of the boat, banging my back against each, each one along the way and landed in a puddle. That's the last of them then, said the sailor. He turned the boat over with a bang and I fell onto the hard deck in a wet, miserable heap. I laid there for what must have been hours. Then I heard a kind voice. Hello there. Fancy seeing you again. It was one of the sailors from the Titanic. He picked me up and squeezed the water out of me, quite taking my breath away. And then he carried me down some stairs and into a warm room. It was full of passengers with blankets around them. Many of them held hot drinks. Here's a picture of the sailor from the White Star Line finding Polar. He was very wet. And then we have some uh, pictures when they were hoisting up the lifeboats onto the Carpathia and some of the survivors that are having a hot meal after they were saved. Polar! A familiar voice shouted from across the room. It was master. He rushed over and took me in his arms. I was delighted to see him again too, but I was also rather upset to see that he was holding an ugly little brown bear. His mother had bought it for him in the ship's barber shop, thinking I had fallen overboard. As soon as master saw me, however, he hugged and kissed me. He took me to bed with him that night and every night after, forgetting all about the other bear. Poor other bear. <laughs> Here is a picture of them being reunited. You can see a little brown bear lonely on the couch, poor thing. He'll find somebody. This is a telegram that Douglas's father sent from the rescue ship to the relatives at home to let them know that they were okay. There was very few people saved they were very lucky to be. During the next four long hours and days, Master and I spent as much time as we could on the deck, even though it was rainy and foggy every day. But the ship was so crowded with more than 700 Titanic survivors, as well as the Carpathia's passengers, that there was hardly room to move. Master's mother and Muddy Boone spent hours cutting up blankets to make clothes for people who had none. At last, we slowly steamed up to New York Harbor in the middle of the thunderstorm. We were escorted by several boats full of people taking flash pictures of us. Look at the big parade, Muddy Boons, with no brass band. Master cried as we saw the huge crowds of people and cars lining the docks. We were glad to escape the hubble of members of the family who had come down to meet us. This is them arriving at the docks. It was so good to arrive back to New York, no matter what kind of thunderstorm was going on. Here is a pictures of when the survivors were making clothes for some of the people that didn't have any on the Carpathia. And a picture of a three-year-old boy that was wearing a nightgown made out of one of the blankets picture of them making clothes out of blankets and a little boy wearing them. I was happy to settle down to quiet country like Tuxedo Park. The experience we had gone through seemed to bring Master and me closer together than ever before. He made a great pet of me and supplied me with two new suits of clothes 
and a little white wooden bed. I often thought back to how I was almost lost on the white ocean, but I felt much better when Muster, Master tucked me beside him in bed each night and whispered softly in my ear, good night, Polar. Master goes to school now and I am left alone much of the time, but I always look forward to the warm greeting he gives me on his return. He has been a good master and I hope he will be blessed with a long and happy life though I realize that I shall see less and less of him as the years go by. I shall always feel, no matter what happens, that I occupy a large corner of his true and tender heart and that he will be loyal to me till the very end. I'm going to read an epilogue about the family. You're going to learn a little bit about what happened to them after they were on Titanic and a little bit of history. The letters, diaries, photo albums, and memories of Daisy Stannon record and record a way of life that has gone forever. Her family trunk is a time capsule from another world, turning the pages, pages of Daisy's photo albums. One sees pictures of large houses with beautiful gardens where elegantly dressed people attending parties. In the winter, they boarded ocean liners to stay at grand hotels and places like the Canis, the Meridian, and the Bermuda. No one had to work to make a living except the servants who took care of the children and the housework. Few of the small number of people who lived this way 80 years ago seemed to have thought their comfortable world would ever Come to an end. This is Daisy and her stepmother visiting the home of relatives in Connecticut. And remember, Daisy is the author of this book. That's a beautiful home for them to be living in, her friends and her relatives. The Stedden's photo album shows that Douglas, their only child, was the focus of their life. Many of Daisy's photographs show him surrounded by beautifully made toys. It was a golden age of toys when new creations such as teddy bears and electric trains, sets come into being, dressing up in costumes was also popular. And the albums included photos of Douglas in a cowboy outfit and in a Japanese Komodo holding a parasol. His nurse, Elizabeth Margaret Perns, Nicknamed Muddy Boons is often pictured with him since she accompanied Douglas and her parents on all their trips. At the end of one of the European holiday, the Steckens took a train from Paris to Sherborne on the morning of Wednesday, April 10th, 1912. Also on the train were other well-to-do Americans, including John Jacob Astor, whom the newspapers called the world's richest man and shareboard that evening. The Staddens, Astors, and other New York bound passengers took a small boat, the Nomadic, out to the huge Titanic, which had just arrived from Southampton, England. Then the ship left for Queenstown, Ireland, its last stop before crossing the Atlantic. Here is some pictures. This is Muddy Boons with Douglas and his mother, on, in 1909, this was three years before they ever were on the Titanic. This is Daisy as looks on her son and her grandmother, fish in the garden pond. Right here. And this is the family's new automobile that they got. And this is Douglas posing in his cowboy outfit in his grandmother's garden. There's an automobile. Very different from the car you may ride in your parents with today. This is a painting of Douglas in his sailor suit. He wore that sailor suit a lot. 
Polar and other bears like him were made by the world-renowned Margaret Steffen Company of Germany from 1909 to 1929. These bears had white mohair coats, black glass eyes, and stitched noses and movable joints. They would move. International demand for Steffen toys where their button and ear trademark top grew rapidly in the early 1900s. Teddy bears such as this golden mohair brush bear from the 1920s was especially popular. The Steffen Company had an almost legendary reputation in the world of toys and is still considered to be the foremost teddy bear manufacturer in the world. So this is what kind of bear Polar was. In her diary, Daisy Stetton records the pleasant shipboard routine on board the luxurious new liner. What the Steffens didn't know was that on Sunday, April 14th, the Titanic's radio operators received seven ice warnings. At 11.40 p.m. that night, the ship's lookout spotted a large iceberg dead ahead. The iceberg struck the starboard side of the Titanic's bow, and the water began to pour into the lower decks of the ship. Daisy and her husband, Frederick, were awakened by a sudden shock and a grinding noise and a stopping of the ship's engines. They immediately got dressed and went up on the deck where they were told what had happened. Daisy wrote that it was too dark to see anything except some ice on the forward deck, but she noticed that the ship was already tilting and so she and Frederick hurried downstairs to awaken Douglas, Muddy Boots, and Daisy's maid. This is a picture of the nomadic. It was, uh, it is now, well, now at the, uh, the writing of this book, I'm not sure now, I have to look into that. It's a restaurant that's on the Seine in Paris you can actually board that nomadic. Some of the original terriers, uh, interiors are still survived on the nomadic from the White Star Line ship. And this is the only photograph of the Stebbins on the Titanic. And remember that famous photo I told you about with the little boy and the spindle top? That actually is the family and the real Douglas. There's Douglas spinning the top, and that is a real photo of the family on the Titanic. And there's the picture of the Nomadic when it was a restaurant. I'm not sure I have to look into that. That would be neat to visit one day if it's still there. At midnight, the captain ordered the radio operators to call the other ships for help. Minutes later, the crew began to load passengers into the lifeboats. There were only 16 lifeboats and four collapsible boats on the ship. Room for only half or of the more than 2,200 passengers on board. This is a picture of the nomadic boarding passengers on the Titanic. An hour later, crewmen helped Daisy, Douglas, Muddy Boons, and Daisy's maid into lifeboat number three. Then, since there seemed to be no more women and children on deck, about 20 men, including Frederick, were allowed to jump in. The boat was lowered 65 feet to the ocean surface. It was so dark that no one could find a lantern, but until dawn, the survivors of lifeboat number three managed to keep track of the other lifeboats from the ship by following the gleam of their lanterns across the water. Just after 2 a.m., the last lifeboat left the Titanic. There were more than 1,500 people still on board the steeping, tilting ship. 
Minutes later, the bow plunged under the water and passengers began to jump overboard. Then the, fer the feraled funnel collapsed. The Titanic's lights went out for good. The stern tilted high into the air and then the ship broke in two before it slid beneath the waves. The, tight, the passengers in lifeboat number three couldn't persuade the sailors steering the boat to go back and try to rescue people in the water. He was afraid that their small boat would be drawn underwater by suction created by the huge Titanic. Just before dawn, the chilled survivors in the lifeboats spy the lights of an approaching steamer. After boarding the rescue ship, the Carpathia, Daisy Spitten wrote in a, to a friend in Mandarin and describing the ordeal they had been through. One passenger reveals with refreshing honesty what she felt after spending a long, cold, fretful night in the cramped lifeboat. This is something directly from Daisy and what she wrote. One fat woman in a boat had been dreadful all along for never, she never stopped talking and telling the sailors what to do. And she embedded from her brandy flask frequently never offering a drop to anyone else. It was very cold too, just before dawn, when a breeze came up and a chilly blast from the iceberg struck us. As we approached the ship, our woman promptly sprung up in order to get off first, when she had been warned to sit still. And it gave me the greatest satisfaction to grab her by her life belt and drag her down. Huh, I wonder who that was. Hmm. She felt flat in the bottom of the boat with her heels in the air and was furious because we held her there till we were along the Carpathia when we were all charmed to let her go up into the sling first. In the drying days that followed the disaster, the Stippins worked hard to relieve the suffering of those aboard the Carpathia. Their efforts won them the admiration and friendship of that ship's captain, Arthur Rostron. Daisy and Frederick Speedin were remembered by their fellow survivors for their many kindness. And Daisy records in her diary entry for April 14th that she went to bed worn out both mentally, mentally and physically after working all day looking after the people, our special prodigies, besides some steerage passengers. To our friend and Mediterranean, she wrote that we spent our time sitting on people who were cruel enough to say that no steerage should have been saved as if they weren't human beings. This is a picture of Daisy writing in her diary the author of this book, the mother of Douglas, the owner of Polar, the Titanic Bear. But the world would soon ask the opposite question, demanding why so few people from third class had been rescued. And a popular song about the Titanic would claim that they kept them down below where they were the first to go. Historians now point to the Titanic disaster, which was followed two years later by World War I as the beginning of the end of an era where society was sharply divided between the rich and the poor. After the Titanic strategy, the Stepin, the Steppens carried on with their busy lives and travels much as before. But as Daisy wrote, all the values of our life changed and the daily incidents, which once seemed as such important to us dwindled into mere trivialities. Sadly, the Titanic disaster was for a foreshadowing of deepened pain to come to Spittens. Just three years after the sinking of the ship, nine-year-old Douglas was killed in a car accident near the family's summer camp in Maine. It was one of the first automobile accidents in the state. No one knows what happened to Polar the bear. 
Here's a picture of Douglas and Polar at Christmas time in 1912. And him in his bedroom with Polar. You see Polar. Daisy Spitten, who had kept such miraculous records of all her events in her life, stopped writing her diaries at the time of her child's death. But her photographed albums continued, showing Daisy in black morning dress and Frederick with morning bands. The Speedens had no other children and spent the rest of their lives among close friends and families or traveling. Every winter, after enjoying a few weeks in New York City, they traveled abroad. Returning home each spring, they divided their time between Tuxedo Park and their summer home in Maine. They both lived long lives and died just a few years apart. Frederick died in 1947 and Daisy in 1950. Perhaps the word Daisy, the words that Daisy wrote in her school alumni magazine for the young women graduating in the class of 1933, best show for how she remained determined to focus on the good fortune throughout her life. As my mind reverts to the past, filled with the lights as well as the deep shadows that come to so many of us. My Frederick wish is that the memories of your life and your friendships may be as happy as mine. This is the Spittens home in Tuxedo Park. And that is the true story of Polar the Titanic Bear. It really would be nice to know what happened to Polar, the real Polar, after the death of his master. Yeah. I know, Jocelyn. It can be a sad story, but in Daisy's eyes, it could be a little happy in it too, to show you to treasure your life Treasure your parents, treasure your friends, and most definitely treasure your toys. And this is Jocelyn and I for Storytime with Jocelyn, and we will see you next week for another one. Bye-bye.